going to start with uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4 and I don't know that that's going to be up there and that's okay we should have it by now I should have it by now so we'll see if you can follow along with me 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4 moreover brethren I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you which also you received and in which you stand by which also you were saved, if you hold fast that word that I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Very good. Next one that we uh, came to was Romans chapter 3. Verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So that was a little bit shorter. So I have a new one for you that we're going to do. Now there's a reason for our doing this, and I promise that you will be grateful and pleased with yourself when we get to the end of this endeavor. And the new verse for this week is Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 2 but your iniquities have separated you from God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear so that's Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2 and we'll go over that next week and add it to our list turn in your Bibles to the book of John Chapter 16, we're going to finish this chapter this morning. In a slight review of what we've been through in the Gospel of John, starting in chapter 15, we saw that we are to abide in Christ so that we might bear fruit. We saw that we are to love one another as Christ has loved us. And that greater love has no man than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. And we saw that we are Jesus' friends. He calls us friends if we are in Christ, if we have accepted him as our Savior. We saw that he con was concerned over our relationship with the world and warned us that the world would be our enemies or we would be enemies of the world. And we see that in other parts of the world, in third world countries, and we see it beginning to show up in our country. Last week we looked at the first portion of chapter 16 and we talked about having a heads up and a coaching change. And we compared Jesus talking to his apostles about going away and the Holy Spirit coming to guide them into all truth as being like a change of the coach. And this morning we're going to look at the last portion of chapter 16 and see that Jesus gives a last word of instruction for his apostles before he leaves and an encouragement for their joy. And that might be a little difficult to imagine if you have grown so fond of someone, a coach or a companion, and you've been with them 24-7 for three years, and they tell you that they're going to go away, but they want for your joy to be full, and that might be difficult to imagine. But we'll see how he gets to that when we come to that point. So in chapter 16, verse 16, a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me, because I go to the Father. John wrote this gospel. He also wrote three epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and he also wrote the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, the last book in our Bible. 
And in this gospel and in the book of Revelation, if we study it, we'll find that John is somewhat enamored with the number seven. If you've studied Revelation, you are acquainted with the fact that Jesus dictated seven letters to seven churches. There were seven golden lampstands and seven stars. There are seven seal judgments and seven trumpet judgments and seven bowl judgments. In these first four or five verses, there are seven times that John, through the authorship of the Holy Spirit, uses the phrase, a little while. I don't know what you can do with that information, but I find that interesting. A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. So the reason is, he's going to the Father. That little while, I think, for me, means that period of time between his crucifixion and his resurrection, when he then was seen by them for some 40 days afterward. Verse 17 says, Then some of his disciples said among themselves, What is this that he says to us a little while, and you will not see me? And again a little while, and you will see me. And because I go to the Father. You can picture some of them over in the corner of the room whispering among themselves, asking themselves these questions. Verse 18, They said, Therefore, what is this that he says a little while? We do not know what he is saying. Now Jesus knew that they desired to ask him. That's a big point. Jesus knows what we want to ask before we ask. Sometimes you've wanted to ask your parents something. I can remember wanting to ask my dad things when I was a teenager and not having the nerve to do it and going and sitting, especially on Sunday afternoons, he liked to take a nap. And I can remember a few times going in there and sitting on the stool in the bedroom, not wanting to wake him up, but not wanting to leave without asking my question. And sometimes I would say, okay, I'm gonna to count to three and then I'm gonna ask. And sometimes I'd get up in almost 20 before I ask. But Jesus understands what we're going to ask before we ask, and we're going to see the importance of that from the Old Testament in a few minutes. Now Jesus knew what they desired to ask him and he said to them, are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said a little while and you will not see me and again a little while and you will see me? Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice and you will be sorrowful but your sorrow will be turned into joy. In my translation, the New King James translation, at the beginning of verse 20, it says, most assuredly. If you have an old King James, it'll say, verily, verily. That word means amen. Amen, amen, I say to you. You will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice and you will be sorrowful but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Well, Jesus is telling them that he's going away. This is his last instruction before he begins his prayer in the garden that we'll get to next week. And he's telling them that the reason that there will be a little while that they won't see him is that he's going to the Father. The next section, we'll look at verse 21 and a comparison or an analogy of this sorrow. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. Congratulations to the Chapel family for another edition this week. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish. And that anguish would be like a word, 
tribulation. We find that word used concerning Daniel's 70th week and the period of tribulation. She no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. His emphasis in trying to get their attention is going to be on their joy. Think for a moment the difference between joy and happiness and fun. I don't know, and this is just a, a personal thought, might not be real accurate, but for me it works. Fun is what I do, or want to do. Happiness is my emotion that shows on the outside. Joy is happiness on the inside, in light of circumstances that are not good. And he's going to try to get across to his apostles that his desire for them is that their joy is full. Do you feel guilty having the thought that you hope that his desire for you is that your joy would be full? I think he would want for your joy to be full. To be full in him. We're going to try to make an application of this towards the end of this by looking at what John had to say in one of his epistles. Try to apply it to our lives so that we can see about this joy and if we can notice and have joy in our lives. On a side note, Young people, is the winner of the dash with the trash here? Did anyone win that that's here today? I got to witness that at Falls Creek this week. They had an ingenious way of encouraging the kids to take the trash out. They timed them. And they would get behind the door and put the trash bag over their shoulder and run with all their might to the to the trash bin to put the trash bag in and come back. And the winner got points, right? I'm glad that my mom and dad never had that idea. <laughs> so there was joy, maybe fun, in trying to win that. I saw that. It was important to them. Well, verse 23 in this section from verse 23 through 28, Jesus is going to encourage them and tell them that there's going to be greater joy in their direct access to God the Father. And in that day you will ask me nothing, most assuredly, and there's that phrase, verily, verily, or truly, truly in some of your translations. And that's by the way, the seventh time that John used that phrase in this discourse uh, from this evening that he's giving us information about. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. So asking in his name was something new. They didn't have to ask in his name before now. He'd been there with them all the time. Whenever they needed something, he seemed to be able to provide it. <laughs> Verse 25, these things I've spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. And I believe that he probably did that in those 40 days that he visited with them after his resurrection 
and before he ascended. But also through the Holy Spirit guiding them into all truth. In that day you will ask in my name and I do not say to you that I will pray the Father for you for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me. If you want God the Father to love you then love Jesus. I have come forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. In the Old Testament, we talked about a couple of weeks ago on Sunday evening, the difference between prophecy and mystery. And prophecy having to deal with the nation of Israel and the Jewish people and the mystery having to do with the church, the New Testament church, the body of Christ. And that in the Old Testament, this church age in which you and I live was not visible to them. They didn't understand it. The prophets in the Old Testament weren't given that information about the time in which we live. It came along with the Apostle Paul. And he tells us about that in Ephesians and Colossians and so forth. But from the Old Testament, they could have, and certainly the religious leaders should have, known that he was going to go away. If you'll turn in your Bible to Psalm 110, the first verse, it's a psalm that David wrote. And it's prophetical. And it speaks about the time in which Jesus is just about to enter into and he's been telling his apostles about. Psalm 110, verse 1 says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Do you know that the time when Jesus walked with the two guys on the road to Emmaus after his uh, uh, resurrection and he from the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms declared to them all the things that would happen to the Messiah he was using the Old Testament to explain to them what had happened and how that everything that had happened had fulfilled prophecy and so the Old Testament is of great value to us it might not be that it's written directly to us, but Paul teaches us that it was written for our admonition and for our benefit. Now turn to Hosea. If you can find the book of Daniel to the right, there's Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea. And turn to Hosea chapter 5 and verse 15. This has implication that involves even the day in which we live. It certainly did for the apostles. We find a, a pretty good difference in what appears to be the understanding and the wisdom of the apostles before Christ's crucifixion and resurrection versus afterward, especially after they received the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. It's almost like up to this point when Jesus would tell them that he was going to be uh, tortured and crucified and would raise again the third day, it was like they didn't quite understand it. After they received the Holy Spirit at the day of Pentecost, it's almost like all of a sudden they were instant PhDs in theology. And they taught and preached and led people with great wisdom and understanding. And they were used mightily. But at this point, they were like the religious leaders. They didn't quite understand everything that, that Jesus was telling them. Remember, we saw last week, he said, I have many things to say to you, but you can't handle them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come he will guide you to, into all truth and so forth but in Hosea chapter 5 and verse 15 the last verse of that chapter 
Hosea was a farmer. That's what he wanted to do. God called him to be a prophet. God used him as an object lesson to the northern kingdom of Israel before they were taken captive by the Assyrians. God told Hosea to marry a harlot. And God was going to use Hosea as an object lesson to show the nation of Israel how much he loved them. And in the 15th verse of Hosea chapter 5, it says, I will return again to my place till they acknowledge their offense. And as one commentator I like to listen to said, if he says that he's going to return to his place, that means he must have left it. And Christ left his place of glory, came to earth as a man, our kinsman redeemer, died on the cross to redeem us with his blood, and now he's going back. We've commented before, there's three things that we can learn from Scripture. One is that Jesus is coming to die, the Messiah is coming uh, to die and return. And he did that. The next thing is that he's, the Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit's coming and he's not leaving. He's going to stay right in with your spirit when you accept Christ. The third thing is that Jesus is coming back. We understand and we talk a great deal about the fact that he came and he died on the cross. We understand and we talk about sometimes that the Holy Spirit lives and dwells within us. But I'm afraid that as New Testament Christians, we fall down on discussing with great detail and excitement the fact he's coming back. And everything that we see in the world seems to indicate that it won't be long. If you were getting ready to have a relative from a long way off come to your house and you had an idea that they might show up at any time, there would be a whole lot of change going on in the house. Cleaning done, uh, things picked up, uh, the yard mowed, uh, bushes trimmed, all those kinds of things and others that I can't think of and don't want to remind my wife of. But in anticipation of somebody coming, we would make preparation for their arrival. And yet the greatest kinsman that we have or will ever have has said that he's coming back and that we're to watch for him daily. But we kind of fall in with all the rest of the world. Well, it's been 2,000 years and he hadn't come back yet. I doubt he'll be here today. But one of these days, he's going to surprise people. Hopefully, it won't be us that will be surprised. I will return again to my place till they acknowledge their offense. Then they will seek my face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. I believe this talks specifically about the nation of Israel and the remnant that will be left in the tribulation period, the time of Daniel's 70th week, and what will finally pave the way for him to come back will be when that remnant acknowledges him as their Messiah and they ask him to come. And that's what I get out of this verse. Now, one more Old Testament verse before we go back to John, and that's in Isaiah chapter 65. So that's back to the left. Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 24. And this is the verse that ties in to when Jesus knew what the apostles wanted to ask him. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. That verse that we have for our memory verse, Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 2 says that your iniquities have separated you from your God. 
and your sins have hidden His face from you so that He will not hear. But when God's people, whether us in our day or that remnant of Jews in that day, trust in Christ and turn their hearts to Him, He will begin to answer even before they ask. Now back to John chapter 16, verse 29. His disciples said to Him, See, now you're speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we're sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from God. So they're stating their, their belief, they're stating their faith, and look what happens. Jesus asks them a question. Did you know that you can teach people by asking questions? God said, Adam, where are you? God knew where he was. But when Adam had to face that answer, then that began to teach Adam his sin and his need. And so Jesus says, Do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming. Yes, it has now come that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone. And yet I'm not alone because the Father is with me. And we understand that that's speaking of the time when they will scatter, when Judas leads the the enemy to arrest him in the garden. And we come to a triumphant conclusion of his instruction in verse 33. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So now we're going to see if we can make some application. Turn over in your Bible to 1 John. It's John's first epistle of 1st and 2nd and 3rd John. And it's way over in the right side of your New Testament. If you find 1st and 2nd Peter, you're almost there. 1st John chapter 1. This thing of joy and fellowship is a big thing for John. John wants everybody that he speaks to and that reads his words to have the same joy that he had. A sponsor that goes to Falls Creek wants for the students that are there to come to the point in their life that they have the same joy and understanding and love of God that they do. You as a parent want for your children to have the same or better life that you have had. I've commented to you and I hope that it didn't come over wrongly. I mean it in all humility. My desire in prayer is that for every person in this church would have a as good as and hopefully even better than relationship with Jesus Christ than what I have. Because sometimes when I sit at my desk in the morning and I have my quiet time and God speaks to my heart through His Spirit, uh, I just weep being so grateful for what God has done for me. I don't deserve that. And the joy that is there, even in the face of difficulty, uh, it's like that, whatever credit card commercial was, it's priceless. And they say that for humor, but it's the truth. There's nothing on top side of the earth you can trade for the joy that God will put in your heart. And John wants his people to have that type of joy. That's the type of joy, young people, that the sponsors want you to have. And you 
others in the audience, that's the kind of joy that your parents wanted you to have. And in the first four verses of John, 1 John chapter 1, it's like John, picture him excited to tell and to share with somebody that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. He's telling them, look, I want you to know everything that I've seen and heard. I have fellowship with the Father and with His Son. And I want you to have that fellowship. He says that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Jesus explained to the apostles that He was going to the Father and they had direct access to Him. When Jesus died on the cross, that veil between the holy place and the holy of holies was split in two from top to bottom. And it signified that anybody that wants to can go through the blood of Christ into the very presence of God. We don't have to go through anybody else. The Bible says there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And so you can go into the very presence of God through the blood of Christ. And He wants this fellowship to be just as real for us as it was for Him. And lastly, turn to 1 John chapter 5. First John chapter 5. I want to get to 4 and 5, but we'll begin at verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves Him who begot also loves Him who is begotten of Him. In Oklahoma English, that means if you love God, you're going to love Jesus. <laughs> By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is He who overcomes the world but He who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? In our midst this morning, there are people that have all imaginable pressures, heartaches, worries. I appreciated Buck's prayer. Buck has been to a funeral for a family member this week. And yet in his prayer, you could tell that his heart was in tune with God and he didn't question God. He offered God praise. When we have joy in our heart and we face things that we can't change, God gives us the grace and the peace that passes all understanding to trust Him. Sometimes we have no other choice but to trust Him. Some of us have lost loved ones. Some of us are about to lose loved ones. In the last two or three days, there's been four fatalities on roads in Logan County. None of those people anticipated that it would happen to them on that day. When I was in high school and the uh, golf station used to be across the street, Charlie, one night, on a New Year's Eve, me and one of my distant cousins from north of the Skelton Creek and a friend of mine were out doing things we shouldn't be. The Gulf Station is where we 
congregated. It was time to go, and I was going to spend the night with one of these two guys, and so we went back to the station, and my distant relative got in his car and headed north. But he never made it across the bridge of the river. I don't know why it wasn't me. He hadn't planned on it happening to him that day. None of us know. In the prayer room over here, I found this week, stapled together several pieces of paper that were a testimony that was written by Richard Price. And he commented that he had no choice in who he was born to, who his parents were, where he was born, when he was born. And before he was born, the days of his life were already determined. And he quoted from Psalm 139. And we don't know if today will be our last day or not. And so we can't worry about that. We must trust Christ. He wants for us to have the joy that he had. I can't imagine Jesus having joy knowing that he's about to face crucifixion. It's beyond my comprehension. But I know that he had joy because he said so. And next week we'll see that he's going to pray and ask the Father to glorify him as the glory that he had with him before the world was. And so today, you may not feel like you have joy in your heart, in your life, but God wants you to have joy in your heart and your life. And he's provided for that. He's paid the price for us to have that. And that's his desire. That was John's desire. That's my desire, and I'm sure that that's all of our desire, is to have the joy of God in our heart, in our life. And when we have that joy, people will tell. They can tell. And the greatest witness that you might be able to have with anybody is for them to see the joy in your heart might mean more to them than you trying to force yourself into explaining a Bible tract to them. I wouldn't want to discourage that. Go ahead and do that. But a lot of times, they'll want to become Christians because they see that you have joy because you're a Christian. And this morning, if you're not a Christian, if you're not sure... Today, you can make sure. Jesus said the time is coming. Yes, the hour is now here. And next week, we'll see that he talks to the Father about the hour has come. And so if you haven't trusted Christ, your hour has come. And you can trust him this morning. Or if there are decisions that you need to make, this is the time for you. Let's stand and have prayer. Father, we're thankful for this day. Yeah.